Well, good afternoon. Man, I hate to break up good fellowship, but we're going to get started this afternoon. I know Brother Parsons is ready to preach again. This back-to-back-to-back stuff, he's... And uh, we're ready. Yeah, I'm sure he's not wearing down. Let's grab our songbooks as you find your seats again. Turn over to page number 324, 324. Take the name of Jesus with you. Let's all stand together. 324, let's sing it together now. Take the name of Jesus with you. number 447 447 the banner of the cross we'll sing all four verses page number 447 there's a royal banner
feel like that's the adult version of I'm in the Lord's army. <laughs> I just want to march on and on and on as we're singing that. And uh, how many got some help this morning in the previous message? And uh, that'll sure help us if we put it into practice. How many times have you ever gone before the Lord and cast all your care upon him? You stand up and say, I'll just take this with me. <laughs> and we, we pick up and walk back out with it. And uh, you know what we got to do? Turn around, give it back to him, and you just just keep casting. See, that's my that's where I'm going next, Brother James. He's already ahead of me. He might be able to give this. But uh, how many ever went fishing and caught all the fish you needed on the first cast? You put it out there, oh, they're not biting. You turn around and go home. No, you just keep casting. You just keep casting, keep casting. Why don't we do that with the Lord? Just keep, just keep casting it upon him. And uh, all the nervous anxiety and fear, give it before the Lord. Amen? I'm glad you preached that message this morning to be able to help. And uh, we're thankful for it. Brother Tom Donahoe, would you lift your voice, open us in a word of prayer. <laughs> be with us today lord as we hear the next message lord that you have for us i pray that you'd use pastor parsons today lord that you'd fill him with your holy spirit power that you'd use that you give him your words to speak lord that we can be encouraged today lord that we can learn today lord that we can take something with us to get us through the week lord lord i pray that you just uh, continue to bless the day bless the afternoon lord i love you and thank you in jesus name amen amen you may be seated and uh, actually the bunnels and the andrews were actually down at their church uh down at haynes city florida landmark last sunday and uh so of course the bunnels flew back in from vacation yesterday and they thoroughly enjoyed their time down there and uh, brother bunnel walked away saying i'm glad i'm in new hampshire instead of haynes just because of Listen, the magnitude of ministry that's down there that God is allowing Landmark to be able to be involved in. And uh, I'll put it in perspective. What is it, 85, 86 employees? Something like that with Christian school, with college, with church, with print and ministry, with everything. And so go ahead and take that and figure up a uh, weekly salary that needs to be met and uh, be able to take care of it. And so it's no wonder he needs to get away and get refreshed every once in a while and uh, heavy load and uh, go see a grandbaby. And uh, so that's all it was. I get him up here. He can stop a little over halfway in Delaware, Delaware right, Maryland? Maryland, Eastern Shore, and so all God's country. <laughs> so we're thankful to be able to have them. Please be praying tomorrow. And uh, as several are, are driving in, flying in for the meeting, word of this has spread a little bit further than just we're, we're trying to stir up New England, but uh, there's one pastor coming in from out in Indiana, driving in tomorrow, Another pastor and his wife leaving after church tonight from down in Martinsburg, West Virginia. And uh, they're going to be coming in during the day tomorrow. And, uh, of course, Brother Rabin from North Carolina, Brother um, Norris from uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And uh, what the Lord's doing, the whole purpose of it is, is why we started on Sunday is we're not going to be able to, we say, save New England. We know God does the saving. But if our hearts aren't right, and our, we're not saved spiritually and, and in revival, and our families, how in the world are we going to be able to reach out and be able to do anything else? And uh, so we need God to be able to work in our hearts and lives, and uh, we are thankful for that and all that the Lord's doing. And so continue to pray throughout this week. Yes, there'll be a lot of moving parts over the next couple days. And uh, But listen, we still have ministry, we still have um, hearts and families that need to be taken care of, so uh, I want you to know, listen, be in service if you can, if something comes up and there's a prayer request, something, let us know so we can be praying, okay? Touch base with Brother Peter or myself, and uh, and you, well, I was going to say get a hold of Nick, but he's going to be down in Boston all day on Tuesday, pray for Brother Nick, he has to go down for a little bit more testing and uh, biopsy on this coming Tuesday. Is it a biopsy? What do they call it? Uh, it's 
the equivalent of that, just not invasive with a needle going in there. And uh, it's not an autopsy, Noah. And so, but uh, do be praying and uh, for Brother Nick as he heads down there. And so there's a, there's a lot taking place, but listen, I do believe set some time aside for the opportunity for God to work on your heart. And uh, if we give him the opportunity, I believe he'll do it. And uh, I, I firmly believe that, okay? And so we are going to sing another song, get ready for a special, and then Brother Parsons is going to come back and preach again for us. Let's turn over to 333, the Lily of the Valley, 333. How many have found a friend in Jesus? Then let's stand together and we'll sing it, okay? 333, sing it out now. Before the message, Brother Jim Kelly is going to sing a special for us right now. Danger, enter. 
purpose is precious blood Oh to grace how great a debt your daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a Brother Bobby just adds a little something at the end. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Using their talents for the glory of God. And uh, we're thankful for it and uh, all that the Lord's doing. Listen, I, I want you to feel more than welcome uh, to be able to come around. Of course, tomorrow night we'll all be in service together. and uh, But then Tuesday during the day, um, the only thing that may get a little bit I'm not going to say awkward, but we do have a question and answer time open forum in the afternoon time. So there'll be some pastors that uh, and some church leadership asking some questions and we're getting advice from one another, things like this. So maybe don't take it personally. You hear a question asked and you say, I'm the church member they're talking about. And uh, anyway, I just don't want you to take that personal if you hear something like that. But uh, we are looking forward to a great couple days. Do remember there is no service on Thursday. And uh, so let's be uh, pushing these next couple days and to be in service. I do have two good thank you notes that I just wanted to make mention of. One is from the Shaver family. How many of y'all enjoyed uh, the Shavers on Thursday? night and uh, what a blessing missionaries to Iceland and uh, thanking so much uh, for allowing them to be able to come wonderful time of fellowship the food the hotel love offering and uh, being very kind that's from the Shaver family that gave to us and then also Miss Patty that was here a couple weeks ago if you remember her single lady that's going on a missions trip down to Costa Rica uh, out of Heritage Baptist Church down in Norwood Massachusetts and uh, thanking so much uh, for what we were able to do and and uh, to be able to help complete the cost for going to Costa Rica. But uh, what, was, what was not mentioned, and actually the love offering took care of it, was uh, the transportation costs and flight back and forth from up here down to Atlanta um, to be able to meet up with them. And so God took care of all of that. And uh, she is looking forward um, to coming back and telling us about the trip and uh, that'll take place. Her trip is uh, June the 13th through the 21st. And uh, so she was writing a nice note to be able to say thank you for that. And uh, so praise the Lord for it. Well, Pastor Parsons, I don't believe I need to take five minutes and introduce you again. And uh, how many remember who he is and who's preaching? We're starting revival meeting, so you came in for the right time. God to stir our hearts, revive, get right with God, and uh, get plugged in. And uh, whatever it is God has for him. Thank you, preacher. Thank you, brother. For preaching for us this morning. It's my blessing. I'm looking forward my to blessing. the day. It's my blessing to be here. I, I'm glad to call your preacher my friend, even though his brother's brother Danny. And uh, amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning, this afternoon, wherever we are at during the day. Galatians chapter number three. Galatians chapter number three. And then we'll also be in Colossians chapter number one. So we're going to read a few verses in Galatians first, and then we'll turn over to Colossians. I want to just uh, speak to you this this morning. I almost said again <clears throat> this afternoon. Uh, I want I want to just preach a message to you about uh, Kodak moments of faith. When you hear about a Kodak moment, some of you remember what Kodak was, and I believe you can still get those archaic little tiny cameras in a box 
And somebody, if you find the right person, they can process that now and do that. But those are things of the past, are they not? The ages passed us by, but we all remember what the Kodak moment was. It was just a snapshot of time that we took. <clears throat> and so I kind of want to go back with us and kind of talk about uh, Kodak moments of faith. You know, there's things in every one of our lives and um, momentous times that changed us. Amen. I mean, changed us from the inside out, changed our direction for the Lord, changed our family's direction. I mean, really, I mean, not just eternally, but I mean, even here in this life and how we're, what we're going to be rewarded for. And so I want to kind of speak on that, but uh, we'll, we'll pray and ask the Lord to help us. And then we'll uh, kind of lay a foundation and begin reading the scripture. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your goodness and your grace. God, you've been so good to us today, Lord. You've led us. Lord, I pray that uh, you just let me be your messenger boy again, Lord, and just let me deliver what you've put on my heart for these, this people. And, and God, I pray that you'd use me, get me out of the way, just use my lips and use everything that I am for your honor and glory. And, and please say what you want to say and do what you want to do through this service now. In Jesus' name, amen. Kodak moments of faith. I don't know if many of you realize, and we have talked already and kind of given the foundation that Kodak went by the wayside. Now, for all of us, we realize Polaroid is something that kind of revamped again, and it was something you could take a picture, and the picture runs out the front of it. But many of you may not know that Kodak developed the first commercial or consumer digital camera. But they did not sell it. They put it on the shelf and said, we're not going to compete with ourselves. We're not going to do that. And guess what other people did? Although they were years ahead of the technology of everyone else in the camera business and could have made a killing and owned the space, some of you today, if they had continued on, you could probably pick up your iPhone and on the back, the little camera that stuck on the back would say Kodak. Because they owned the space and they, could have, they laid the found work. But what they did, they took it to the CEO and he killed it in 1992. And Kodak continued to sell film. And it looked like it was a good decision for about five years. Do you know, <clears throat> I've learned this in my life, that you know that God, there's, we always talk about vision. Vision of the future. And being able to see past just what's right in front of us. And listen, folks, you and I will never have the vision that God has to see or foresee the future this book that we have, I've realized this, any camera that I ever ha have ever had is always limited by the lens. You know, and the worst part is some of us, most of the time we look up and we didn't take the cap off. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, and I mean, I still, I feel like I'm talking generationally when I talk about the cap on the camera, amen. And, uh, <clears throat> and so... But I do feel like sometimes when we're looking down the road or we're looking for our future, we need to realize, and I, want to, I just want to try to lay a foundation for you. Vision is something that we all need, but the, but the lens that we ought to be looking at it through is this lens. Everything down the road, everything in my life, every step that I'm going to make, ought to be, we ought to attach the lens of the Word of God. And everything should be measured by this book. Every, every perception of What's going on in the world? When we take in the news, the way we process it, the snapshot that we take of it should be this book. And for every one of our lives, sometimes we miss this, that, that for all of us, even in our jobs or what we're doing, and I mean, even for us in the future, I mean, even the church here, you know, uh, growing and, and the, the conference that to think that, I mean, this church, man, I, I was just talking with somebody about the growth and what God is doing here. That's great, but God wants to do that all over New England. He doesn't want to just do it here. His desire is to see all men saved. And if we're not careful, we get so zoned in and not looking at everything. And while, one of the greatest things, I've, I've seen churches that grow, but man, I, to just talk about missionaries, to get so focused on yourself isn't good. If you come to our church and we're growing, but man, I, I, I got to put the bulletin out. And I told everybody on Wednesday night, I said, hey, make sure you look at the bulletin because the 13 names of the brand new missionaries we took on this year are on the back of that. 
And I, I, last year I got to take on 16. And so the gauge is, is big. You know, my gauge is, is more than what I have to put out a month. We were talking about. You all were talking about casting your cares, you know. Amen. That was a care I had to cast early on in, in the pastorate. Amen. And just what the Lord does on a monthly basis at our church and through there. But I'll just say this. I've learned this. And I'll, this is a message from this morning, and I hope it helps you. But I didn't want to say it this morning. But if you don't cast your cares on Him, it's really hard to cast the net on others. Sometimes we're so focused on us and we, we, we miss things and miss others. And folks, sometimes, you know, you got health, health issues and we could talk about all these things. But I'm just going to tell you, when you've already cast your cares on the Lord and you're trusting Him with it, then while you're still sitting in the doctor's office, it's real easy to cast the net for other people who are still in the midst of their cares, in the midst of their worries. And they can't cast their net, they can't cast their cares on the Lord because they don't know Him. My... The Lord, my pastor that I grew up under, his wife has gone on to heaven now, battled breast cancer two different times in her life. And she talked about how it was the blessing of God and the road that he took her through to do that because she won, I mean, hundreds of people to Christ because she was sitting in waiting rooms on doctors and sitting in places and going through all the medical things and being with, she won doctors, she won nurses, she won people who were going through the same thing. She could relate to them. And she was sitting there with a smile on her face singing a happy song and they were like, how in the world are you able to do that, amen? And sometimes we, people, we, we're peculiar people not because we're weird, but because we have hope in Jesus Christ. And again, all of that comes on how we look at things through the lens of this book and through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter number three, the Bible is going to say this, and I'm just going to try to, I'm not going to read, and this is a hard passage of scripture on the Galatian church, because Paul has laid his foundation of why he's writing to them. And he begins the chapter in verse one with, oh, foolish Galatians, how would you like to have that letter written to you? Take the cap off. Take the lens cap off the camera. Sometimes we, sometimes we wonder, well, how in the world could that happen? Because they had begun in Jesus Christ and then they had drawn back. They had added to things that, that w they were already taught. They had taken on things that they were told not to ever do. And as Christians, and especially for a preacher, it, you know, we talk about he's saying, you know, be careful coming in here on Tuesday. Because we're talking, listen, you know, what pre you know what preachers say about people? You got people, you got problems. You know what I say? If you got a preacher, you got problems. <laughs> Amen? Because again, what's the preacher going to do? He's going to be after you. Amen? I'm going to tell you, as much as I want to comfort, I discomfort. You know what Paul did? Every town he went to, Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas preached, everybody said, yay. Paul preached, everybody said, let's kill him. Everywhere they went. And I mean, you just got different kind of preachers that and how God works in those things. And so all kinds of different people. But boy, wouldn't it be great if we all looked at the things of God through the same lens and we had some vision of the future of what God wants to do. And all of us could get on the same page and realize Jesus is coming again. And that he's one day closer than he was yesterday. And with everything in the news, it looks like he could come tomorrow. And I've decided a long time ago, the lens of Jesus Christ, I'm going to be found about his business. I'm going to be found not casting my cares on him. I'm going to do that in my own time, in his own time, but I'm going to be found casting the net. I want to be called up casting the net for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he says in verse 5, he's going to teach us here. I'm going to read down a little ways, but he's going to say for us, he's talking about Abraham and the mystery. And for many of us, there is a misnomer in our age and just for let me say this I'm not trying to be mean but anything that came out of the Catholic Church okay that is Methodism Presbyterians Wesleyans Lutherans anything all right all of them have a certain amount of reformed theology all right and that means that they think that they have replaced Israel now they won't always say it to you and they're not always apparent about it but Reformed theology means that there's a certain amount of replacing of Israel in God's plan. And that's not true. The Gentiles got added in because of God's grace. 
And even Paul said, I can see what you're talking about. I'm, te I'm teaching through the book of Romans when I get around to it. Amen. When, when we get around to it at church. And one of the things Paul deals with in the book is like, hey, even if you were right and God did whack all the branches of the Jews off, he grafted in you, in you as Gentiles. Why couldn't he graft them back in? And then he goes on to say in the same book that there'll be a day when he comes back and we all look for him to come back for the Gentile church, right? The Jewish church, everybody that's saved in this age is going up as a church in the rapture. But Jesus is going to come back in his second coming one day. And every Jew, the Bible says, will turn and see him for who he is. And everyone will be saved in, in the single, I mean, in a moment. Because they'll see him face to face coming back and they'll go, then he's going to ride up close enough and he's going to say, they said, where'd you get them wounds in your hands and in your side? And Jesus is going to say, I was wounded in the house of my friends. Can you imagine being a Jew that day? And, the, and, the, and what will strike through you, their heart as they realize that their Savior came and laid down his life and they're the ones that said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. It will smite them. Lord, they'll, they'll turn to him and they will serve him throughout a millennial reign because of the, what they realize they've done to him. They will serve him as priest. Hey, folks, I'm just telling you, he comes out and he says in verse 5, He therefore that ministers to you in the spirit worketh miracles among you. He doeth it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. By the way, miracles still happen in this day and age. One of the Kodak moments of faith for my church that I grew up in here, Landmark, in the faith, getting trained at, they, have, they talk about often the miracle offering. Now, for us at our church now, I won't tell you how much exactly our budget and what goes on monthly, but back then, we needed to buy the 10 acres for our Christian school and grow that's next door to our church. It was a big orange grove back then, and the preacher... By faith. The man that owned it, worked at the bank, said he would never sell it to the church. He wouldn't even sell it if they offered him $100,000. $100, now, back then, it was big money to them. And he said, well, I will give you $100,000 for it. He said, if you can have it by next, he gave him like two Sundays, I'll sell it to you. Because he never, he did not believe that the preacher could get the money together. And I'm going to tell you, our people, now I'm not kidding you, our people went to the bank and borrowed money. Now, I'm not telling you to do this, all right? The Bible says, oh, no man, anything on the earth, right? <laughs> I just preached that earlier, right? But I mean, they went to the bank because he said, we need to have a miracle offering. And in two Sundays, we need to raise $100,000. And after those two Sundays, the second Sunday, over $100,000 had come in. Because people went and borrowed it and gave it to the church. And they spent the next five or six years paying it back. But the church had the money to buy the land that wouldn't have been for sale after that two weeks. That the man didn't want to buy. And he saw God do a miracle. Folks, you know, I mean, if you look back, the Kodak moments of faith, Hebrews has got a whole list of them. In chapter 11. Kodak moments of faith where God showed up and showed himself real and did miracles. The whole New Testament is full of them. Listen, if you looked at your life, I can tell you about some miracles that went on in my life. I mean, my dad being saved is a miracle. My, I mean, me being in church today, if you knew my family and the side of family I grew up on my dad's side, you'd say, man, that's a miracle that he's here. You would definitely say it's a miracle that he's a preacher. I mean, my family would rather fight than eat. Sometimes they'd eat and go back to fighting. But God saved us out of it. He said miracles. Look at verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God. You want to talk about a miracle of faith? Abraham believed God and God counted it as righteousness. Listen, he left, went out of the Earl of the Chaldees, wandered and wandered. And then God said, I'll give you a son. And then put him off for a while. Do you know when God says he's going to do something, I found out he ain't always going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. 
He goes on and he says, Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that that which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Folks, I don't know if you understand this or not, but God isn't done with Israel. God is going to reinstitute. And you know what? All the people, and this is a sad thing, there are people that call themselves Christians, and they stand up and preach against the nation of Israel. There are people that believe that God is done with them and that He's working through His group of the church. God's not done with them, but He has given them blindness in part, the Bible says. Right now, it's like having blinders on. But for us, we don't, we don't have a, a narrow camera. Think about being a Jew and having a narrow camera. The Christian life, listen, we, have, we, we know that Jesus spread his arms out. Why? We don't, we don't, we're not just limited to the, the tiny little camera lens view. We have the panoramic view of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelations and realize that he's come, that everything he said he was going to do, he's done and he's still coming again and that he's going to set up a kingdom and rule and reign for a thousand years. And that same God, that same, listen, that same God is one I can serve. He can do miracles in my life. He can change me from the inside out. He can work in my family. He can do a great work through this church. We can see miracles. Back there is a book, I'm sure, on the table that says his hand is real. It's all the experiences of Pastor Carter in his lifetime. Somebody asked me the other day, where was my biography? And I said, I'm still writing it. God's still working on me. I still am, I, God's still doing miracles, and I'm looking forward to what he's going to do. Folks, I'm just telling you, if, we, if every one of us were able to sit down and just things that sometimes we think are nonchalant, Little things, if we were to pen them down of what God has done to bring us to a place, to bring us through our lives and to help us, we would have Kodak moments of faith that would change the world. Listen, and you know what? You get an opportunity. Now, on my phone, I could take a picture out right now. And I'm not going to show you all my pictures here, okay? But, I, you know, none of you are going to be able to see this, I don't think. But I'm proud to death of this little boy I got, Okay. Now, see, that? See that's my grandchild right there. Okay, now, he's, he's got two, you know them little, what are they called? Sticky notes. Thank you for that. He's got sticky notes stuck on both sides of his head. Now, you all are, would probably look at that picture and say, that kid, he's not very smart. But I said, come here, boy. I'm going to take a picture of that. Now, I didn't have a Kodak camera. I had my phone, and I took my picture out, and I said, now, that's something to remember there. Now, you know, he won't remember that, but I will. And I'll say, I remember when I was going to New Hampshire to preach to a church, and I just swung into your house. And it didn't really do anything to change you, but it changed me. I remember those things. Do you know there are people in church that will come to church and they will never remember what you did for them? They'll never remember who welcomed them and who gave them their spot, their seat, they have no idea who did everything to make sure that the church was ready, the church was clean, and everything was ready to go. But all of the things that the church did, even though they don't know it by name, for them, when they get saved, it's a Kodak moment of faith. And even though you're just a part of the background, you, might, I mean, you know, we live near Mickey Mouse, you know, and, and I, don't, I would never dare call my pastor, but my pastor's name is Dr. Mickey Carter. Okay, and so most people come down. If you're fundamental, you want to see both Mickeys while you're down there. That's what, you know, that's what people tell me, right? But, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many photos. And I was going through some of the photographs, and I thought, who in the world is that person in the background? You know? I've often thought some of the things that, you know, my kids stood beside. I was like, I wonder who was in that suit. You know? I mean, they got pictures of Goofy. It wasn't really Goofy. There was some guy in the Goofy suit. Hey, folks, you know, even at church, for all of us, you know, they'll, they'll never remember the person working in their nursery. But to them, they had a miracle that day. And the, and the thing is, sometimes we don't always see us at miracles. Bus routes. I mean, picking people up with your car and bringing them to church. One of the things I had to, you know, all the things a preacher leaves town we have to do. My wife 
Last thing we were doing, making sure that the ladies, we have a, a village, a retirement village, and, and one of the ladies is, she's not driving, and my wife had to make sure somebody else went by and got her because we're getting her right now, you know? Make sure somebody else got her to church. Now, she's been faithful. Her husband used to put roofs on, was one of our deacons, good man in our church. He's passed on. She can't drive anymore. But amen. I mean, somebody went and made sure that, that happened today so she could be in church. For all of us, look at Colossians with me, if you would. You see, the Bible foreseeing, it said the scriptures foreseeing. Do you know how you're going to get foresight in your life on how to raise your family? Foresight on how to stay in church? How to have Kodak moments of faith throughout your life? It's always going to come back to Bible principles that you put into practice in your life. Do you know, even taking photographs, there are certain principles of how to take photographs. There's principles of lighting, and there's principles of angles, and there's principles of how you want pe their posture when they're standing or sitting. You know, a way to make someone look thinner. I appreciate all those people that know how to do that for me when they take my photograph. There are some photographs they take, and I was like, that picture makes me look fat. And my daughter would always say, you know, Grace, she'd say, that's because you are. And I was like... Thank you for making me feel better. Amen. And so, you know, but I mean, for all of us, we have to come to a place in our lives where, again, isn't it really great? I don't know about you. I, a few years ago, they had one of those, um, what are that company called? I don't know. One of those companies that comes through and does a directory, you know. And, uh, and I did not want, I did not want to buy those. I told my wife and, you know, it was, it was you know, they were coming through and I said, all right, we'll get our picture taken for the, for the directory, but we are not buying pictures. But I'm going to tell you, when I saw those pictures of my family, they had my heart. I was like, man, there were some good pictures. I have to buy them. Because, I mean, they did, they did a super good job. Look, I, I've taken pictures with my phone, but I didn't do nothing like they did. Hey, do you know for all of us, it's a wonderful blessing in our life. Here, Colossians is going to tell us that when we take some spiritual pictures, we, the best way to have spiritual vision or foresight is always to trust the Word of God. And the Word of God is going to tell us here in chapter number 1, if you would, and then verse number 7, it says, As ye also learned of Epipharius, or as ye also learned of Epipharius, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful servant of Christ. They're trying to describe how they had heard of the Colossian church church at Colossae. He says in verse 8, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. For this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleas and being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness giving thanks unto the father which has made us meet to be to partakers of the inheritance of saints and light the word meet there is a special word for us all right meet means suitable it just means that uh, for there's an inheritance for the saints and what other people I just, you know, there are some pictures that I have had taken of me that were not suitable to go on the Internet. Now, I'm not talking about being at, we don't like, you know, in independent fundamental Baptist, we don't call it the beach. We call it the shore. Okay. But, I mean, there's pictures you just don't want out there. I, and in this age, you know, it was so much easier when they had Kodak moments because you could keep the pictures or you could burn them. But in this digital age, somebody will be taking a picture of you that you don't know took it. And they'll post it somewhere for the whole world to see. And you get Kodak moments that you didn't want to have. And the scripture here is going to tell us here in verse 12, he talks about being meat. In another passage, he uses the same meat and for meat for the master's youth. But he, you see, he says here, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meat to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And I chose this verse for two reasons. One is like, I really want to be suitable. You know, when I go, when we took those pictures and I'm going to take pictures, I got ready to take pictures. You know, when you're going to go take pictures, you don't just get ready to take pictures. You want to match. 
My wife wants to go out and make sure everybody in there's got the same color tie on her. Everybody, the girls are matching and the guys are matching and it just seems like a fiasco to me. But you know, when the picture's taken, I appreciate it. When she makes a big portrait, I'm glad that I was made meat. Amen. To be a partaker. And you know what I didn't like? It says with the saints and lights. I don't know about you, but I really never wanted my names in lights. I did. Even when I'm getting my picture with my family, I hate those bright lights that they're shining at you. And, you know, you're trying to, you know, I, we have those people at our church that they, let's go outside and get a picture of you and your wife. It's, you know, it's Resurrection Sunday and we're matching and they want my picture taken. And they Here, get in the light. Yeah, that's the greatest place. And I'm trying to do this. And you know, I'm like everybody else that looked at the eclipse. You know, my eyes are burning, you know, I, you know, and you're like trying to hold your eyes open without having to do this. And, and it's so bright, but I'm so glad when I go back and I see the Kodak moment that my family stood together and we were lined up and we got everybody staged just right. And sometimes, you know, along the way, I really wasn't having a great time. It really wasn't always the thing I wanted to do, but the scripture here is going to tell us some things. And I want you to go back and look at it with me just for a few minutes here. In verse number eight, he says, who hath declared unto us your love in the spirit? Do you know, we talked about earlier, and again, I'm trying to build on some of it, but we're supposed to love one another. But you know, we're not just supposed to love each other in the flesh because of what people can do for us in the flesh. But there ought to be a spirit and the spirit in the scripture there is not a small s, not in your own spirit, but in the Holy Spirit. When we're saved and we're together as, as Holy Ghost born again Christians with the Spirit sealing us, we have a love one for another that the world doesn't have. We have the ability, and even before, when you thought people were unlovely and I can't love them, the power of the Spirit of God can empower you to love the unlovely and for them to love your unloveliness too. And to get by all the things that have come in the past and to love you right here in the present and to do all the things that they can do. And one of the things that really shocks the world, the thing that Jesus says, when people walk in the back door or the back door underneath and come up the stairs or whatever, whatever your back door is. Amen. The big thing for all of us that we have to realize is that what people will say when they come to my church and they come to your church is I just felt the spirit of God in the place. And you know what they really said? It's like the people liked each other. It was like they loved each other inside the church. And you say, well, that's easy. That's not hard. No, it's not easy. It's something that all of us have to work at. It's, all, it's something all of us have to yield to. And, you know, sometimes I'm going to be honest with you. You know, when the aisle gets filled up and you really don't want to be nice. I played football. Sometimes I just want to put my shoulder down. And go through the aisle instead of saying, excuse me, excuse me. You say, well, you're just a ruffian. You're right. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I mean, for all of us, we come to the place in our life where we don't always want to be gracious with everybody else. Sometimes we just want to get where we want to get or go on or do something that we're doing. But the greatest thing is we realize, and again, if you're not careful, you'll do it just in the flesh, just to be gracious to somebody else so that they'll be gracious to you. But when you do it in the spirit, you love somebody else and God allows you to walk on by them and to do that. And even when they bump into you or they put the shoulder down and barrel out the back door, you forgive them and you move on. You don't say, I didn't do that to you, so you shouldn't do that to me. You know, I mean, somebody already told me I parked in the parking space today. Right. I mean, for all of us, that's that's where we live. If we're not careful, we'll under and listen, we can smile and we can laugh about it. But Kodak moments of this life happen for several reasons. Look at verse 10 with me. He says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Do you know that you are always a picture of Jesus Christ for the world after you get saved? Your church member, you're saved and on your way to heaven and you name the name of Christ everywhere you walk. You ought to walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every moment of your life is a Kodak moment. You have no idea who you will bless. You have no idea who you can invite to church. You have no idea who you will impact. You have no idea who's sitting next to you in church. You have no idea who parked beside you. You have no idea 
where you really are in this life and who you can affect every moment of your life. And so why not decide I'm going to make every moment of my life a Kodak moment for the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm going to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Now all pleasing means this, that everything that happens in my walk is pleasing to God. Okay? Now sometimes if we're not careful, we'll make it about all fleshly things. We'll make it all about whether, you know. Now I love, we, we actually send out Lester Roloff over the air. Now Brother Lester Roloff didn't believe you ought to drink coffee. When he got to heaven, God handed him some coffee. <laughs> I had somebody come up to me and say, I'm not listening to the radio station anymore. That brother was preaching against gum. I said, that brother preached against everything. If he, if he didn't think it was good for your body, he would preach against it. But you know what? I'm just telling you, for all of us, sometimes, just like Brother Roloff, we get so enamored with the things that go into the body. And none of those things, I'm going to be honest with you, those affect us. When we please God, it's about how we affect others. It's the stuff that comes out of a man that defiles a man, not what goes into him. Now, I do understand what goes into us affects us. It affects how we're going to be powered through the day. And I'm not trying to throw that out and say that it's not important. It is important for your personal health. But trying to say, you know, listen, if you say you're more godly if you drink, you know, eight ounces of carrot juice every day, all that's going to do is turn you orange. Okay? I mean, that's what's going to happen. You drink enough of that. You eat enough garlic, guess what happens? You start stinking like it. Now, they're both good for you. Okay? And they will change your outside perspective for other people and give you some funny Kodak moments. Amen? Of the life. But how are we walking? And our walk is always, it's, we're told to walk circumspectly, watching out for the devil. But here we're told to walk worthy. Walk worthy of being called a Christian. Do you know that... Christians, none of the apostles, that none of the 11 were ever called Christians first. The ones that really were called Christians were Barnabas is sent to Antioch to a group of people who has been saved in the book of Acts. And he begins to teach and preach and he realizes that he needs help. And he goes get a doctor of the law named Paul and brings him back to Antioch to help him teach the church there how to live and to walk worthy of being the Lord Jesus' saint in the light. Amen? And you know what happens? The world says, those people look like Christ. They're Christians. They walk worthy to all pleasing. I want you to see this. That's how we, listen... For me, I put down this, number one. We all need to get a picture of who God wants us to be. Because if you took a picture of me all the time and everything, it's not always going to be a good picture. But when I get a good picture of what God wants me to be, I start changing who I am from the inside out. And my perspective on how I speak to people and how I act and where I go and how I do those things. And he even says this, it will affect four different areas of my life. And I wrote these down. It says, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. It's going to affect my walk. It's going to affect my work. And it's also going to, listen, the wealth of knowledge and increasing in knowledge of God. When I start to really get to Kodak moments of faith, I just, listen, I want to take a picture of everything and I want to picture the way Jesus walked, the way Jesus worked, the way Jesus spoke and the way he taught. I want it to come out of me. You know, I, I may have said this before, but we came to Bible college. I was 30 years old. And uh, took my kids and moved to Haines City, Florida. That wasn't the easiest thing. We had four at that time. And then Grace came along at the end of our Bible college experience. And, but after my first year, my niece, who was my, Sherry's oldest brother, came to Bible college and lived with us and went to Bible college with me. And so we would have church. And at night, we'd sit in the house and she'd say, Brother Barry, Uncle Barry, what do you think about that? And I'd say, and I'd give her a chapter and a verse. And then she said, I don't, I don't want to hear about what the Bible says. I want to hear what you think. 
And I said, it doesn't matter what I think. And I went back to chapter and verse. Because when we get to the place in our life where the Bible answers for us, we're walking worthy of the Lord. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter my opinion. What's God's opinion on the matter? That's all knowledge. That's increasing in knowledge of God. Listen, I, I picture what? <laughs> picture what God wants you to be. Do you know what changed my life? Is I, I felt like God had, had, a, had a direction for my life. And he gave me a stop shot. I mean, you know, and I saw that in his word. I saw that and I had chapter and verse in my life. And I began to try to match up with the picture that God gave me of what I could be in him. And so many times, if we're not careful, we'll be happy with the Kodaks that we have of what God has done. And, and listen, there's nothing wrong with just being saved. But I, I want to have a good walk. I want to get to heaven and stand before the Lord and him say, you had a good work. I want to do this thing. How are you going to accomplish either one of them if you don't have a wealth of knowledge of God? You know, church, you know why we gather together? To hear from God's word, to help us grow, to get a picture of what God wants us to be, to help other people get a picture of what they ought to be. I want you to see number two. Look at verse 13 and 14. He says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. You know how I remember, I like to have the picture. And I, again, for you and I, and I, you may be like me here today, okay? If I'm going to be all pleasing and be like Christ and look like him, you know, I realize when I look myself in the mirror every morning, I don't really look like him. In the picture God gave me of what he wanted me to be, I ain't made it there yet. But I sure ain't what I used to be. And what helps me is sometimes the Kodak pictures of faith for me is that I can take out what I used to be before I began trying to walk worthy before I began to try to have a good work, before I tried to get to the place where I had a wealth of knowledge of Jesus Christ in my life and know how to have direction. And I'm telling you, every once in a while, I, I get discouraged and I have to take out a picture of what I used to be. And I start thanking God. You know what he says in the verse before he starts? Is look at verse number 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet. None of this is something that we do on our own. It's something God has to do through all the things we preach prior to now of yielding and submitting ourselves to the, the ways and the work of God in our own life, but then deciding I'm going to live a life that's pleasing to God. And then when you get discouraged, going back and say, Lord, help me be what you want me to be. But thank you for bringing me so far and helping me. That, not what I used to be. Listen, folks, I don't know about you, but I, I don't have I don't have a testimony. I can't stand up here today, and I praise God for it. I can't tell you about all the drugs I used to take. I can't tell you about all the drinking I've done. I can't tell you about all the smoking that I've done. I can't tell you about how I lived a crazy and wild lifestyle and all the women I ran around with. I don't have a testimony like that. I just grew up in a good church. The best things that ever happened to me in life happened in church. I was a good kid and I grew up in the church and I got saved. I met a girl in church and I got married. I got baptized in church. I don't know. I'm not going to. Don't get mad with me. Okay. What is it about this bar? Everybody wants to get married anywhere but church. I was happy to get married in church. And our church wasn't. Listen, a lot of them, they'd be like, oh, the colors just ain't right in the church. What? My church that we grew up in had John Deere colors in it. It was green carpet and yellow pews. Amen. Nothing matched that except for John Deere tractors. What was our colors like white and purple? Amen. I don't know what the rest of it was. She tried to put a purple tie on me and I said, no, ma'am. I made all the guys in my groomsmen wear them though. I said, I'll, I'll match everything. I just went all white. Amen. White shoes had helped me written on the bottom of them. Amen. 
I'm just telling you, when we, when we, listen, if we're not careful, we'll forget that God is doing a work inside of us. Sometimes we do, just like anybody else, that we're climbing a mountain and, it, and it's steep and we're not moving as fast as we used to in the Christian life. But it doesn't mean we're not still going forward and we're still not moving. We ought to thank God for what he's done and ask God to do more. You know, we preached about casting all our cares on him. Once we cast our cares on him, we ought to start casting the net for people. We ought to start casting anchor in the things of God and not let anything move us back to where we used to be and hold on to things that we ought to hold on to and let go of the things that God wants us to let go of. But picture who you used to be without Christ and it'll give you a stark contrast and you'll say, I'm so glad that my pictures today don't look like those pictures back then. I'm not what I want to be yet, but I'm not what I used to be. And then finally, you know what changed my life when I finally started realizing that I couldn't. <laughs> Look at verse number 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that were in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. Do you know that was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ? I remember the day that at Bible college, I grew up in a good church. But, and I know, I, you know, I wasn't the sharpest rock in the box. I wasn't, you know, I was probably more rounded like a bowling ball or something, you know, I don't know. But for me, I remember the time that I realized that Jesus was the one that stepped out on nothing and spoke everything into existence. And it was a shocking moment in my life when I realized that the one who left heaven and saved me was the one who created me. That he was the one that, that even according to the scripture, made me up and holds me together. And when I realized he's the one that is still working on me, then the, to get a good picture of what I want to be, I need to know him better. Because the Bible says that he is the image of the invisible God. The only picture that we have, a real good picture of who God is, is Jesus Christ. His apostles and lived with him and <laughs> when they doubted him and they would say something about, show us the Father. And he said, have I been with you so long and you, you don't know who I am? Because sometimes we, start, we compartmentalize God that he's not really all three and one. We just separate him. And we want the Father, because they all have different jobs, by the way. You do realize in Ephesians chapter 1 that one of the most foundational things for your salvation will be when you realize that God chose you before the foundation of the world, that Jesus died to redeem you, and it is the Holy Spirit that seals and keeps you saved. When you realize that you didn't do anything to even really act on it, but God did before the foundation of the world, that Jesus left heaven... <laughs> what, almost 2,000 years before you were ever born and died and paid for your sins. And then the Spirit, the moment that you asked Jesus to come into your heart, He is the one that came in and sealed you. And you couldn't even keep yourself saved if it wasn't for God living and sealing you every day. When you get that down, that's a boondaba moment. You say, what is that? I don't know. <laughs> to me, it's like, I don't know how to explain it, but it's good. I say boondaba, you know. I heard one person say it was an epiphany. It sounds too feminine for me. <laughs> boondaba. <laughs> that sounds more manly to me. So thirdly, every one of us, to be what God wants us to be, we got to picture who God is. And the only way we'll do that is take the lens of the Word of God and uh, really... Get Jesus into focus in our lives. And when he comes into focus and we picture who he is and we say, that is my mark. I'm not there yet, but he's still working on me. And by the way, the greatest Kodak moment in your life will be the moment in the twinkling of eyes at the last trump. You will be changed into his likeness. You know, it was a changing moment in my life when I realized 
when I meet my Savior face to face, I look just like him. And not because of anything that I've done, but because of who he is. Because of what he's done. Folks, listen, this life, I want to go to heaven with Kodak moments where I can say, Lord, look at all that happened in my life. And he's going to say, I know. I'm going to go to my grandparents and I'm going to say, look what God did after you went to heaven and, and you, you prayed for me and got me to this point. Look what God did in my life. Look at the miracles he used in my life to change me and to help me. Folks, I'm telling you. When I realize, when, listen, if you wake up every morning and realize this is another opportunity for God to do a great work in my life, it will change you. This is another day for God to do a great work through our church. I don't know how many of you woke up this morning and all the cares and all the worries of this life and you thought, mm, today is the day that God is going to do a great work at Granite through my life. And in my life, it'll change a church when they get like that. When they realize miracle offerings turn into miracle Sundays. Listen, I'm telling you, God, I got one for me. Hey, I had, we had this big thing called Restorathon. Brother Danny knows. We stay up, you know, till midnight begging people for money on the radio. People like to hear us go after each other and laugh. And then we try to get back on focus and ask for money. And then we hit hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we've had people the last couple of years fly in to see how we do it. And I said, you can come, but God's the one that does it. We're just idiots on the radio, just talking and hollering at each other. And people just decide, maybe if I give some money, they'll stop talking. <laughs> I really believe that's kind of how it goes. And then when we get to the end and God does it, and we get the hankies out, and we start waving them in victory, and we have a good lap. I thought, man, that's the greatest thing. That, I mean, God did a miracle, and he did. But, you know, I, I, got, I got alone by myself, and I started thanking God. I said, God, you did it again. I didn't have anything to do with it. You did it again. But you know what would be really good, God? That was just money. I said, but Sunday's here, <laughs> and I'm not going to be preaching. And I know that you can use this man that's going to be preaching, and I mean... His girls got up and sang, and he got up and preached on just, I mean, a simple truth. Preached about 25 minutes on trusting him. I mean, simple as it possibly could be. Had our teenagers in the auditorium. The place was packed out. I mean, there wasn't hardly a seat in the place. And I mean, I knew God was doing something. And we had the invitation, and a few people stepped out. But, I mean, nobody really hadn't moved. And I knew that people, I knew in my heart that God wanted to do a work and people needed to be saved. And, I mean, I kind of like stopped the thing. We were three, I mean, three hymns into the invitation. And I was like, listen, if you're here and you want to trust him this morning for your eternal destiny, would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Now, that's what we normally do at the beginning. But I was like, listen, I'm resetting this thing. God wants, to do, God wants to do a work. I don't want to miss it. And I thought, maybe one person gets saved. Eleven hands came up across the auditorium. And people started stepping out and coming. And I'm going, can I get some people down here to help me? Because, I mean, we have people that are ready to help, but we didn't have eleven. People come out from everywhere. You know, you say, well, that was just teenagers. It wasn't just teenagers. Do you know a couple stopped a bus that morning and said, I don't know where you're going, but I know you're going to a good church because you pick up people and take them to church. We want to go. You know, that, that couple was living together. They were living together and just burdened about their sins and wanted to go to church. Rode the bus in. They came and walked out opposite aisles. And got saved. The next Sunday, they came for baptism. I noticed on the card, I didn't get to them during the week. They didn't have the same last name. I said, listen, you know, before you get baptized, we all take care of something. He said, oh, preacher, we took care of it this week. We went down to the courthouse and just got married. 
We knew you wouldn't let us join a church like that. <laughs> and they got baptized. He say, why? Because that God was working in their life. God wanted to do something. And sometimes, I'm going to be honest with you, if we could just get out of his way and get in on his plan, he has a vision. And we just need to catch the vision. It, there's, a, there's a vision I had of this word of the invisible God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he has changed everything about my life. He's done everything that's ever been done that's good in our church. And I don't ever want to see, I don't ever want to see the day that he stops working in me or in my church. And so I simply do this. I oftentimes will bow my head in my heart and say, God, would you continue to work? I want to walk worthy unto you and all pleasing. Would you do a work today? Would you just let me preach? I often say this and I pray before I preach. You know, the Bible still says this beautiful, and there's only one Bible, by the way, in English that says this exactly like this. The unsearchable riches of Christ. One, and it's the King James Bible. You know the new King James Bible changes that? Why would you ever want to change that? This book is a book about a Savior who has unsearchable riches. So listen, Kodak moments of your life. Could you take a snapshot of what God wants you to be and pursue it? And what the end of that will be will be exactly what Jesus looks like one day. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I don't know where you're at tonight. If God has spoken to you and you, I mean, listen, I believe every one of us ought to want to have Kodak moments of faith. But if you haven't started by being saved, that's the starting block. You need to first accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. But if you're saved, it's just becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. As the preacher comes, I pray you do what exactly God asked you to do. Your heads bowed and eyes closed as Joshua begins to play softly. If God's spoken to your heart, you need to slip out, come find your place at the altar, spend some time with the Lord. Let me ask you this. I think sometimes we say, God, here's the picture of what you want me to be. But I think sometimes it's prideful. We live in a day and age where everything's airbrushed and everything's touched up. You know what the thing was about those Kodak moments years ago? It took a picture of who you were. Today, you can change this. You can change and, and uh, make all these adjustments on it make us look real good God knows what's real and boy we touch things up we're not exactly who at least who we present to everybody and I wonder if you just need to say Lord help me to be conformed into the image of your son that's what we're predestined to look like anyway the image of his son, the image of Jesus. That's what we're going to be. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I'm concerned about it enough. Would you pray for me? Would you just slip your hand up, slip it down? I'm not saved. I've never called upon the Lord. And I say sometimes we get that little confusion, and I understand it. I've called upon the Lord, but I'm not who I need to be. Well, you just take the right steps today, getting to be like the Lord and get up tomorrow morning get in the scriptures take the steps be looking like the Lord that's who we become he'll finish out this chorus I pray you're spending some time with the Lord turn your eyes upon Jesus If you'd look up this direction, I'll pray in just a moment the way grace can say things. First time I went down there and their, their daughter 
and uh, had one of my greatest accomplishments, Dana and Charlie. It was right after we hiked Mariah, and I hadn't been on snowshoes in 30 years. One of my greatest accomplishments. We're five and a half, five, five and a half miles up to the top of that mountain. I'm as exhausted and tired, but I'd made it. Took a picture up at the top. I said, this is so beautiful. And then I collapsed and laid down and rested. <laughs> I did. And I said, boy, this is beautiful. I'm keeping this memory. I get down to Florida. I'm kind of proud of myself. I made it up there. We're sitting down eating supper, and Grace is there, and uh, she's asking about New Hampshire. I said, we hiked the mountains up there, and I'm telling her all about it and told her about Mariah. Boy, I just hiked up there, and boy, here's what we did. Man, I took out a picture, and I showed her that. She said, you went all that way for a picture? <laughs> it was humbling. I said, she said, I can go Google that and get that same picture. I said, go ahead. <laughs> I couldn't say nothing to it. And uh, so absolutely wonderful. Miss Crystal, is there anything you want to get right with Pastor Parsons about the parking spot or anything? <laughs> she confessed it to me. She sent me a text. and <laughs> She had texted me in the first. Okay, Miss Sherry, you get to eat. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll dismiss. Father, we sure do love you. Lord, thank you so much for how you've spoken to our hearts. And Lord, I, I do pray that it would be the desire in each and every one of our hearts that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. And Lord, if we'd take the time to be able to look back over our lives and just remember those times and those miracles and those snapshots when you just did it. Lord, it wasn't us, it was you. Lord, how we long for those to continue in each and every one of our lives. Now, Lord, would you help us, give us rest tonight, prepare our hearts for the messages tomorrow and Tuesday. Lord, I pray that we would discipline the flesh, that the spirit may be revived. And Lord, would you work in our hearts and lives now, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. 